So um, I want to talk about two different groups of people. Um, we here are vibing on Ethereum, right? We all go to the raves, or we try to go to the raves and, and, and make it in one piece. Um, we like hack in the basement, like proud to be here in this conference and, uh, you know, among friends again, like it's, it's, it feels very nice to be here surrounded by people. We love people that, um, are vibing with us. There's another set of people that we discuss much less, which is people that are living on Ethereum, right? People who actually use Ethereum as a tool for their everyday life. And of course there's an overlap between the two, right? Like some people here probably get paid in crypto or in Ethereum or Ethereum stable coins. Some people might spend some of that every month. And uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to like, bring your attention to, that the fact that there's two groups, there's an intersection middle, but um, in general, I think we, or myself, um, given that I've like, dedicated my, my time to explore this space because I care about financial inclusion and I care about the like, good potential for this technology, um, even myself, I haven't, I feel like I haven't dedicated enough time to talk about the other group. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned. But first, uh, that's like recognizing that, like, which, which group would I be a part of? Like, do I live on Ethereum or not? Um, this was in 2018, two good friends and, uh, and I uh, hacked on um, ETH Monositis. That was my first Ethereum event ever. And again, like, the vibe was great. This is where I got to meet the community. Um, and we hacked on a project that was like non-financial, nothing related to, to using Ethereum as money or like stable coins weren't even a thing back then. Um, and, uh, it was, it was a great community. It was, it was a good experience. Um, and then, um, coming from Venezuela, like I experienced high inflation. So this is like, gives me another reason to vibe with the community, you know, like the, the values of, uh, having better money, giving people access to better money and all that. Uh, but the fact is I went to school in the United States and I have a bank account in the U S uh, and I'm part of that like group of financially privileged people that many, many of us also are right. I care about, you know, FDIC insurance. I care about like having stable savings in dollars. And I know that we are building services now that are approaching those levels or, or maybe even will beat those levels of, um, resilience and, uh, and trust, but, um, we're not quite there yet. So. Uh, I mean, I use credit cards and I enjoy their convenience. Um, so if I were to be completely honest, I'm part of this first group of like more vibing on Ethereum than, than living on Ethereum. So I've tried to get closer to the other group by uh, asking questions, by, by seeking them out, especially, you know, people who were maybe not so much in the intersection because I'm sure here in this conference we can find people in the inter intersection, but people who maybe dislike Ethereum or, or maybe not even think about Ethereum much. Uh, people who wouldn't come to a conference because, or, or to a, to a different conference because Ethereum doesn't mean as much to them because they have other parts of their life that they value better. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Started working at uh, BitRefill. It's a company that's been around since 2015. Um, it focused on Bitcoin in the beginning, but now there's uh, other uh, coins and tokens that, that uh, we accept. And it's very convenient, for example, to refill uh, a phone. So if you got your, your cloud of SIM cards that you got on this conference, you can go online uh, and uh, top them up. Um, and it's in, uh, a lot of countries. And this gives me the opportunity to talk to people who are not necessarily using Ethereum or Ethereum uh, or services on Ethereum to, because they vibe with the community. They're not part of the community, but because they, it gives them a superpower that they didn't have before, which is, it could be filling up a phone, could be, uh, other, other services that we offer as well, like buying gift cards. So you can offer offload your crypto that you have without necessarily going through a bank account, um, and so on. So, uh, while it's nice to talk to the people in this conference, uh, and, uh, you feel like in your comfort zone, um, I think, 
yeah, like I've started to, to talk more to, to like customers of refill in particular here. Uh, and I can't say that I've learned that much yet from them, but I have, it, it like sparked my curiosity and, and I think I have more questions than answers in this talk, but I hope that you can also get questions from, from my explorations uh, so far. So I've got two archetypes here uh, that I want to discuss. Right, so the first one is George. He lives in the USA. He worked in oil and gas. And what he wants is to make money fast. And there may be some people here that also conceive Ethereum as an investment tool and as a, as a way to invest smartly in protocols that will change the world. And you know, it, that you'll get rewarded for it. Nothing wrong with that. George in particular, remember, he doesn't care much about Ethereum. He wants to make money fast. It's like, what are, like I mean, who, who wouldn't like that, right? Uh, and uh, he can use any means that he deems, uh, you know, uh, moral, legal, uh, convenient to attain that goal. So in 2019, maybe he was uh, working as an Amazon reseller. So he used websites like these to like engaging activities like, like drop shipping or just like flipping products, identifying products that uh, would sell for a premium uh, because he, he thought this would be a good way to make money fast. Fast forward to 2020, then he discovered eToro, right? And you may be familiar with it. And then he started trading Forex, right? And he wasn't particularly interested in the financial world in, in the beginning, but he saw this as a way to make money fast. And, you know, it's evolved in, into this uh, as like a, as a side job, right? Then in 2021, he discovered Uniswap. And uh, suddenly he became an Ethereum user uh, but not necessarily an Ethereum community member, right? Because remember, this guy doesn't really care much about Ethereum. He cares about making money fast. Um, and now in 2022, of course, he's using Binance because, uh, you know, all of these options to earn money, you know, uh, the vault, the investment, the staking, all of these new verbs that will be invented soon. Um, it's so much, you know, like they, there's so many options here. So you could say that Binance kind of superseded Ethereum for, for this guy as the way to fulfill his goal, which is making money fast. Um, let's go to another case. Uh, Silvia is a copywriter from Argentina, uh, and he wants, she wants access to a US dollar account because she doesn't trust her national currency much. You've heard this narrative many, many times, I'm sure. You've probably met people from Argentina, from Cuba, from Venezuela, from other places where the situation is ex extremely bad. And I, I think we would all are agree uh, that the community values um, are that there's nothing wrong with wanting to have more financial stability in your life. So um, remember, she doesn't really care much about Ethereum. She's not part of the community. She doesn't vibe with us. You wouldn't go to the raves, uh, but she wants financial stability. So in 2019, she discovered Tether uh, on Ethereum. Fees were pretty low at 10 cents uh, of a dollar. So maybe she got paid in that. She had a wallet, uh, maybe it's MetaMask, and, and she got paid using Tether, and then she used Telegram groups to offload that into uh, her Argentinian bank account, just uh, tried to preserve the, the value of the dollar as much as possible uh, before actually cashing it out to, to the bank, right? And you know, now there's better options for this, but in 2020, uh, suddenly the fees were $15, right? And everyone remembers this. Um, and then what did Sylvia do? She just switched to Tron because, again, Tether has been a tool that, that has been around for, for a while. You may have your opinions about it. And, you know, we as technologists may have some concerns or some fears about it. Um, and certainly the same with Tron. Uh, but guess what? It's a tool. She doesn't really care much about the technology. She doesn't care about the community. She cares about not spending $15 uh, on every transaction that she makes. So of course, she switched there. And then 2021, maybe the fee went up a little bit, but you know, she's still happy with Tron. And then again, in 2022, uh, she switched to using Binance because you know, Binance pays now ubiquitous, she can pay for anything. And if she ignores the casino part of Binance that doesn't really interest her, uh, Binance is a crypto bank. And uh, now nowadays, they're people building like crypto banks that have uh, maybe more aligned goals um, with us than, uh, than Binance where, you know, maybe it's not so uh, driven towards uh, 
participating in, in like money making activities, just like the first guy, the George, but just to preserve the value, like more, more like your typical bank account experience. So, uh, and then it's also convenient because she doesn't no longer has to use her Telegram groups. Uh, she can just go on a P2P uh, marketplace of Binance and she can find an offer really fast. Um, and uh, it's also like, it's very cheap. Uh, the, the fees for this uh, services are cheap and uh, to receive or send uh, UCT within Binance users is free. So again, convenience wins in this case. So after that in 2022, what may happen? Maybe she will uh, convert from Tether to BUSD. It's um, because, you know, maybe Binance will provide further incentives to use BUSD. Um, so what about, you know, why doesn't she use, as, as technologies and as part of the, this community, we may ask ourselves, why doesn't Sylvia use Optimism, Arbitrum, like uh, ZK Sync? Why, why, doesn't, why isn't she on DAI? Like, is, is, uh, we would like her to be on, like, part of better uh, aligned, more credibly neutral systems, uh, and the systems that have her well-being more in the core values, because what can happen if the Tron network goes down and Sylvia loses her money um, or, you know, there's, there's many risks with other, like with, with using other tools that are, have not been built with, uh, you know, the same care perhaps that, that Ethereum or, or the, some of the uh, tools of Ethereum at least have been built. So um, we would like to kind of push these tools to her, but we haven't done a great job at marketing them. We haven't done a great job at... Um, making them uh, accessible in the markets where they are needed most, right? Uh, so she'll probably gravitate towards uh, Binance, right? So I think this is um, just, again, like it strikes uh, a question uh, that I've had for many years and I think I still haven't resolved it yet. So who is Ethereum for? Um, and who, like whom should we prioritize and, and how, how should we measure our success um, is TVL, for example, a good way to measure Ethereum success? Uh, or is adoption in peer-to-peer -peer markets uh, a better way to do that? Um, so maybe I want to open it up. Um, I know like this, this, this talk is, uh, is short on, on purpose because I actually want to hear more from you uh, and your experience and, and maybe complement the two examples that we just showed here. Um, if anyone here gets paid in crypto and is comfortable like sharing an experience, uh, and I, I can, I'm happy to go first. Um, I've been paid in USDC uh, sometimes, and my experience has been that uh, because I studied in the US, I can cash out USDC one-to-one -one for US dollars in a bank account, which is what I ultimately want because I, I like that stability, right? Even though, you know, there's huge inflation, whatever, it's, it's, uh, it's still a means for me to preserve my, uh, my savings. That's way better than, for example, keeping the money in Colombian pesos or keeping the money in Venezuelan bolivars, obviously, right? So I, I use that tool uh, to be able to, to cash out with like no fees, uh, like I think I'm bothered by, by having even, you know, like a $10 or $15 fee because, I mean, I, I want my, my salary whole, right? So maybe that's uh, something that is, again, very privileged because I have access to, to things like Coinbase and so on. But um, maybe someone like Sylvia that actually prefers USDT because it's more liquid in her local market has a different experience. So if anyone here has an experience of being paid in crypto, I'd like to hear from you. What um, what do you use? Like what uh, or or what product have you been surprised by the experience, be it good or bad? Um, and uh, yeah, what what can you share from that, if uh, if anything? So maybe I think there's going to be a couple of volunteers here with mics. Uh, and if anyone raises their hand, I will just call someone randomly over there. Um, Hello. Yes. Oh. I'm here in the back, so you can't oh, see okay. me. The lights yes, are too bright. I see you. Okay, great. So my name is Mel. I get paid in USDC and in ETH and in our company's token. And I use a Visa debit card called Monolith to do all of my uh, payments. So indeed to solve like the problem of how do you actually live on Ethereum, like tool, you know, like tools that tie back into the real world very easily are needed. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, 
Do you have any concerns with uh, the Visa card at all, or has it worked smoothly for you always? <clears throat> so it does work very smoothly, but indeed, um, because it's a non-custodial wallet, you have to actually send uh, an Ethereum, well, you, you do a, an Ethereum transaction when you top up the card, and so there are gas costs, which for myself is fine, but for a you know, 100 million user base, you know, people use a base, that might not quite work. And so your point in your presentation, I totally understand how, you know, we here in this crowd are very idealistic, but, um, you know, normal people or ordinary people, they just care about ease of use and less fees and getting the job done rather than these idealistic concerns. And have you used other chains uh, other than Ethereum, or have you considered using other other stuff, or or maybe even you know, you you're using a custodial service, uh, so it, it's another ledger that that they have as well. So you, you're you're using more than just Ethereum, um, and that's that's fine. But I, I think it's uh, it's worth also highlighting that Ethereum doesn't stand on its own, or at least it doesn't. We would like it to be uh, like a full suite service, but it's not yet, right? Yeah, it's going to take a lot more work from people in this room to realize that we should be building for the general public and not for ourselves, really, in the long run. Otherwise, you know, companies like Tron and Binance, they're going to eat our lunch, right? And we're going to be <laughs> sitting here whilst the whole, like, the whole world moves us by. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've actually been surprised by the fact that like, Tron is under-discussed in, in, in conferences like this. Like, and it's... it's not good to focus on a competitor only, right? Uh, but it's something that, like, m many people aren't even aware that it's eating our lunch, and it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just think uh, some m more people sh should be aware of it, and we should again have the right metrics in place. Because I, I, ha I had a really tough time looking on like Dune dashboards and DeFi Llama and places like this to actually find the information that was more towards you know, like the users and, and how many people were actually using these things rather than, you know, TVL and uh, other metrics that I don't particularly care much about, so. Yeah, I, I think, like, our goal here should be to improve the world and to take civilization along with us. <laughs> and um, I love your talk because you're kind of giving us a, a reality check. So well done, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I have another question then. Um, anyone here uses crypto to cover expenses? You already yes. covered that and you use your Visa card. Anyone I has like a different experience yes. uh, doing that? Here. 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 Yes? Yes. Here. 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 Uh, here. Okay. Uh, I see you. Yes. Uh, thank you for your like, presentation. Um, I think it's like here in Latin America, we face a really huge problem when we want to make the off ramp from our crypto. Uh, let's say I, I also received my payment from my salary in, in, USD, in USC, USD, USDC? USDC, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and also another in tokens. So let's say like this, in the, the, the part that I received from USDC, I just save in my custodial wallet and the other like in my non-custodial wallet. Because at the end of the day, the one that is in the, non the custodial wallet, I use for like day by day cash and pay my staff. Um, here Would you mind Latin sharing what, what service that is? Yes, uh, here in Latin America, it's like a wallet which is named Bio, uh, which make here in Colombia the, the, the off ramp of peso colombiano. Mm -hmm. So I, I use that. Um, but yes, like that is one of the biggest concerns regarding how we make the, the off ramp of my money uh, because there is not so easy channels for withdraw my money and let's let's be clear in Latin America how everything moves is by cash. Uh, yeah. I, we will be there in some years but nowadays we need cash and, and that's how I solve like everything my expenses here. So if, if you had one request for people building systems like these, or if you were yourself, like I had the resources and, and, and wanted to build something like that, like what, what is the biggest problem that you face yourself that uh, like 
when when you're trying to off ramp the crypto that you've been paid, you know, you use that crypto to cover expenses. Exactly. What would you say? Uh, I think one of the biggest concern is easy access to these alternatives that are already linked with traditional players because at the end the off ramp should be or they have they must be a link to traditional financial system. So I think that is like the big concerns for the future. It's like how at the end uh, the, the, the next wallets, the net uh, solutions that help us this are already linked to the traditional system, to the traditional financial system, because yeah. these are the ones that will give us the chance for, for spread the, the use case of crypto. Yeah, thanks. I, I think we've dreamed for a long time of uh, this like adoption, like merchants and uh, like the circular economy. And uh, at BitRefill, we're trying to make that happen by uh, listing private businesses on our site, where you can like buy Amazon cards, you can buy Uber, you can you know pay your, even your credit card in the U.S. Uh, now it's a new service that we have. And, um, and then you can pay it with crypto. Of course, we're still an intermediary, but it, it gets us one step of the way um, to actually making this crypto easier to use. Um, so just one, one more person there. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted just to cover um, our experiences with Bitso, because I'm from Mexico. Um, we got very lucky. We got a, a universal basic income through proof of humanity. So to cash it out um, for my mother-in-law, we used Bitso, so we had to transfer, um, we had to swap the UBI token in a stable coin, then we send it to Bitso, and uh, my Which mother stable coin, sorry? Sorry? Which stable coin was it? Um, I think it was in USDC, uh -huh. and then it was uh, swapped for Mexican pesos and cashed out in um, Mexican uh, bank account, but the experience in Bitso is very simple and my mother-in-law can do it alone So that was the positive part and she manages to cover some of her expenses through um, Well through the universal basic income she gets so yeah, thanks for sharing um, And what, what about the fees were, were you satisfied with what you were charged or would you think like because I think we want everyone to have kind of the same level of access, right? And it's very difficult to maybe have, uh, like on, on Coinbase, again, in the US, you can swap USDC for dollars one-to-one. -one. There's no fees, right? Because they want to promote that. Uh, and I would like everyone to have that kind of American privilege, if you will, but it, it seems harder to do in Latin America. I don't know how your experience was like there. Yeah, I think the, the fee was bearable. Like, uh, I don't remember it being anything overwhelming. The biggest fee was transferring, uh, swapping um, the, U, the Universal Basic Income token in a stable coin because it's on mainnet. Um, but we did it through CowSwap, and they have some gasless swap. So, well, th there are perks, you know. But yeah. Bitso doesn't have um, fees that are that big. I think we may have time for maybe one more person. Uh, can we get a mic over here? One more question. You got like a minute, so. <laughs> really quick. Uh, it's pretty funny. You just pretty much, the first guy you described was me. Uh, I'm a petroleum engineer. They found a different way to find a, there we a go. e commerce work nice. and eventually got into crypto. So it's pretty funny. But besides that, I think they, uh, there is a, a huge difference in type of markets. There's people that want to invest and there's people that want to just use, right? Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things that I love your, your, your talk about because there's a huge disconnection, at least in, in South America, in how can we do what you're saying. I'm also American, so I can have the prayers of being able to just do exchange in, in the US, but in South America is so difficult. And um, I don't know why in this, at least in this, uh, I was hoping to find uh, 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 the answer here, Yeah. but I could not find anything. I've been pretty much in we every to build single it. talk, yeah. and I have not. And, and I know that everybody's trying to build the next ecosystem, but I think that we have to start from, like you were saying, understanding what the real people want to do. And like right now in South America, there's a huge need for this technology to decentralize many things. But the financial is for sure one of the biggest ones. And I think that, I mean, if I can, if somebody here that's developing so many tools, at least try to think about to create this ecosystem and be able to make it easy for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way I was doing it before was just like, 
trying to identify people who really need it, like Venezuelans, Argentinians, regular people. Uh, but that, I think, is a lot harder than finding people who are already using it, but not for the reasons you think, or, and they, they're not vibing with us again, like they're not part of this, but they're still using it. So like, try to get the jobs to be done from, from that perspective. And for sure, and another thing, I think, uh, I know sometimes some people see marketing as like the devil or bad, but I think it's so much Necessary. need yeah. of like people to know what it is. You know how many times I talk to people and I say, I do cryptos and they see me like the devil. Yes. It's because they don't understand it. They don't know what it is. And like, well, that is fake. It's just not. So yeah. thank you. All right. That's done. Thank you.